do a few notices, first of all, uh, a little bit about the society and so on. Um, then we'll have a, a planetarium visit on Stellarium here in the room. We're not actually using the school planetarium yet because we don't want to have too many people in a very enclosed space just yet. Uh, then we'll have a news item from Len, and then that'll be followed by George Sheldon, who will give us an update on the King's Langley sundial. Then the main presentation from Aris, and then we'll have finally refreshments at the end. That's an unusual sort of configuration for our meeting, but we'll do it this way this time. Okay, so just to make a quick note, fire exits are left and right and at the rear. Uh, toilets are at the rear near the main entrance on the right and on the left, and also at that door at the back on your right. Uh, the barrier and the gate closes is at 8.15, so if you're coming to these meetings, make sure you get here before that time, otherwise it might be difficult to get in. I hope everybody managed to, you know, use the gate code tonight and it all worked okay for you. If not, let me know and we'll try and find out a way of doing that. So we are recording this meeting, so uh, be careful of what's said and done. I encourage you to use the speaker view, which just includes the speaker up in the corner and uh, the main presentation as shown. And we'll take questions at the end, if that's okay with everybody. And um, just a little bit about the Southwest Hearts Astronomical Society. We're currently 144 members, so we've grown about 24 members since last year. Founded in 1968, in 2018, we celebrated our 50th, had a great few celebrations for that. Uh, we hold our monthly meetings from September through to May, and it's usually the last Friday of the month that we have that, but it does vary according to school requirements and also feasts and so on. So just uh, always check on the website, that's the best up-to-date place. We have our own observatory at Flondon and we have access to the planetarium here at the RMS when, it, when it's possible. We have a monthly newsletter. Actually, an interesting thing about the newsletter is um, at the end of last newsletter, I put a little note saying, if you read this, please let me know. I only had four responses out of 133 emails. <laughs> So we might not be continuing with the newsletter. It's, you know, I'm up to suggestions of what we can do, but uh, it's a lot of work to put it together and, and get it out. And if it's not being read, then there's no point. Uh, our subscriptions, 16 pounds for an individual, 24 for a family. A family can be, you know, two adults, two kids, or even four kids. We're not too fussed about the actual size. And then we've got our own website as well, which you should visit. Uh, just a quick word about this site. We are guests here at the Royal Masonic School and we've got to be careful where we go and do uh, things. So we sometimes have meetings in the Newmark Hall, uh, which is that area there. That used to be our regular meeting place, but now we're, we're more likely to be in this hall. Uh, uh, and um, you go through the barrier, then you've got the gates and the recommended route is up through the Central Avenue. I've put up some signs tonight for those people who are here the first time. The regulars will know the route, they could do it with their eyes closed. Just to mention that the observatory for the school is, is positioned here over in the science block. And uh, right beside it then we've got the planetarium. And the designated route for going to the planetarium from here, should we be able to go back and do that, is that blue route. Uh, okay, our observing site is up at Flondon High Top, and we recently had an open day there, so many of you will, will have seen that. All the regular members know exactly where it is, but it's the end of a, a bridal path lane, and it can be overgrown in summertime. Uh, wintertime's a little bit better, but it can be very wet as well, so if you go up there, you need to wear your wellies. So there's our little dome and uh, we've our main telescope, as you can see there. And we meet on Saturday evenings at 8 p.m. And that's the usual meeting time. If the weather's bad, we just sit in the hut and discuss all things from astronomy to football, mostly football, I think. Um, okay, to find it on Google Maps, uh, you just literally search for SWHS Observatory. So if you just use that as the keyword, it'll bring you right to the, the point where you need to go. Again, most of you know where that is, so there's no need to do that. Um, I'm going to mention about upcoming events. It's all a bit tenuous at the moment, and I'll try and explain why that's the case. For the October meeting, I'm hoping that we will have a link up with Dunsink Observatory in Dublin. 
and they will give us a virtual tour of the observatory, which is, I've, I've seen one in the past, and it, it was very informative. There's a lot of history to Dunsink Observatory, and a lot of very famous people worked there and performed science there. So it's a very important um, observatory in, in terms of world observatories. The fact that we can now do Zoom here means that that next meeting could very well be a hybrid meeting, which is the presenter might be in Dublin and we, the audience here, and uh, we haven't got all the kit necessary to do that properly, but uh, tonight is a test for us to see if we can uh, at least attempt it. So there's a question mark over it yet. Uh, so watch this space for that. Then in November uh, the 26th, I'm hoping to have a presentation for you for the Mars Perseverance Rover. Now these two might actually be interchangeable events. We don't know yet, but we should know in the next week or so what exactly is happening. So again, we'll publish that on the website and we'll let you know by email as well. We've tentatively penciled in a quiz on the 6th of December with the Aylesbury Society. And then on 10th of December, members images bring in by uh, the usual thing that we do at Christmas to help celebrate Christmas. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Richard to come up and uh, we'll do the uh, planetarium presentation. Uh, Richard apologizes that he has to rush off and be elsewhere in the morning. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be okay. I'm just going to mute my mic and hand it over to Richard. That needs to be, but, uh, if you want to hold it out until that, no, do this. I've got to stop sharing. And I've got a screen share. Okay. Am I, uh... Well, good evening, everyone. Um, huh. This is a bit of a test run, as, uh, as uh, Sean's already said. Um, what we're going to look at, I'm just going to make a few alterations to the um, system. So bring down things. The trouble with Stellarium is that when you turn it off, it doesn't maintain any. Um, of the changes you put in, so you have to do it all again. Which is quite irritating. Anyway, we need it here. So let's get rid of that. Right. Well, this is the current um, site in the evening sky with uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, I don't know if anybody's been looking at Jupiter and Saturn recently, um, but um, they're well worth looking at. Although they're very low in the sky, uh, we're going to see Jupiter for the next few next couple of months. Um, although it's well past opposition, but it, it's such a large disk that you can still see quite a lot of detail on it. In fact, I've been using um, a little four-inch, um, the five hundred millimeter telescope, and I've seen quite a lot of detail, particularly in the equatorial region. So uh, it's well worth having a look. Um, you can't really miss Jupiter. It's about the first thing that comes out in the evening sky uh, when, you, uh, when, you, when it gets dark, which you will, of course, be doing quite a lot in the next, next couple of months. Um, now, one of the advantages with the... With the um, this nothing. One of the advantages with... Uh, Yeah, well. <sighs> yeah, it's gonna, yeah, just doing the, I'm just, just trying to click out and click out of this. It'll go. Eventually. That's it. One of the advantages of, the, of this time of the year is that we get to see all of the best sights in the sky in one night. You might not believe that, but it's true. And if we include the three um, stars of the summer sky, which uh, you can easily see this, one of them, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. Now they are currently in the, in the sort of southwestern part of the sky. There's a lot of detail, a lot of, in, a lot of things that you can look at in that area made up by that triangle, for instance. Um, there's little Sagitta down here, which is this constellation here, this is Sagitta. And if you want to look for the Dumbbell Nebula, for instance, it's located just, just a little bit up from the first star in, in Sagittarius. 
Um, there's other objects you can look at in the same, in the same area. Uh, how do we get rid of that? Yeah, it's going. There you go. So there's, there's quite a few interesting objects you can see, but I've already pointed out the Dumbbell Nebula, but also located here in this constellation of Vega is another, which is the Ring Nebula. So that's two objects. Um, another one, of course, is Vario, which, or Vario, which is this star here, which is a famous double star that everybody likes because it's nice yellow and, and blue, and it's easy to see. In fact, you can actually see it in good quality binoculars. Um, there are other, other objects. Um, for instance, on the other side of Deneb, on each side of Deneb, there is a, um, a planetary nebula, which is worth looking. One of them is NGC 7027, and the other one is called the, the over the other side, which I can't remember the number of, it's located about here, is um, the blinking eye planetary, pla planetary, which actually, as you as you look at it, if you look at it with your central foveal vision, you'll see that um, the, the central star, star, if you sort of look away and use averted vision, you see the nebula. So that's why it's called a blinking nebula. Not anything to do with the blinking nebula, it's always in the way. Um, okay, so also there's this beautiful little constellation down here, which is called Delphinus. Now I always like to point out Delphinus because it's an easy constellation to recognize in binoculars. Now it has a challenge. It has two objects. One of them is really easy and one of them is much more difficult. So if we go, if I go down there to highlight it, the star here is Gamma. Now that is a very attractive double star, quite easy to see in a small telescope with a reasonable you know, high power. But if you follow the stars, these two stars across, if you come to a position here, there's a, a globular cluster that's um, NGC 006, which is actually one of the most remote globulars in, in the NGC catalogue. And you'd think you can't see it, you couldn't see it, but you can. At least you could do a few years ago from my location, you can't now, but it's, it's all, it will make a good imaging site, an imaging object. And that of course applies to any of the objects I've pointed out. So let's go a little bit, little bit further over because we want to want to bring in a few other objects. Um, now, high in the sky, you'll find the W of Cassiopeia, which is this object here, this, this wavy W. Now that is virtually, it's a, it's a constellation treasure because there's just so many things there that are worth looking at. And they, they, some of them will be worth looking at in binoculars. For example, um, located in, in it, it there, that, that particular star there, which is between gamma and alpha. That's alpha, that's gamma. And there is a little star which is called Eta. And Eta is a double star, very attractive, blue. There's a, a, a bright orange primary with a, a blue star just a little bit away from it. It's quite easy to see in even a small telescope and uh, well worth looking at. And that um, also, next to being quite close, there's another little cluster, which is down here. And that's um, sometimes called the ET um, cluster. It's NGC 457, and it's a really easy thing to look at. You can see it very easily in the small scope. And uh, what it has two eyes. And, and um, so I was told by, I first showed this object to a lot of people at the Whirlpool Star Party in 1991. And a lot of them, one guy came up to me and he said, oh, it's a leprechaun. I can see him winking at me. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's like very popular. It has another name, the Owl Nebula, but the ET Nebula has been very popular since the film ET, the extraterrestrial came out. So, that's just a few of the objects that you can that you can look at in the in the sky. I'm trying to trying to see if we can wriggle over a little bit more and bring in bring in. Yes, it's coming up. Yes, I think. <laughs> yes, there we are. There is Andromeda. 
this line of stars here. And you've got just above the, the center star is the famous, uh, famous um, Andromeda spiral, M31, which um, is a good object in binoculars. I wouldn't say telescopic views. You need to really know what you're looking at and you need to really concentrate to see a lot of detail. So then we come on to the late autumn, the late uh, coming, into the, coming into the winter, when Capella, which is down at the bottom of the screen here, let's see if we we'll move it up a little bit. We go up. Yeah. That's it. Capella down at the bottom of the screen. Um, if we can come up. That is, will be high overhead at the moment. It's, you know, again, it's quite difficult trying to get this to go in the right direction. But further along, you also have Perseus, which is underneath, and the, underneath Cassiopeia, and that is rising in the east and will be really prominent. In fact, by midnight, it's high, on, high in the sky. And that has a lot of clusters, um, including the famous double cluster which is certainly well worth looking at. So there's plenty to look at. Once Jupiter and Saturn have gone down, which they will do, and Saturn, I'm afraid is not, it's, a, it's, it's worth looking at, but you can't see a lot of detail, so it's worth looking at just to see the rings. But other than that, um, certainly have a look at Jupiter because there's a lot going on and it's quite easy to see. So with that, I'll, uh, I won't trust my luck anymore. <laughs> I'll, uh, Call it quits from there. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Richard. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for that, Richard. Very informative. So say Richard's Encyclopedia of the Night Sky. The next part of the presentation is going to be with uh, Len. If I can get this to move forward. So Len's going to come and talk to us about some news events uh, that have been recently happening. Okay. Well, it's great to be back. Get my notes out. So, since we last met at our Zoom meeting on the 28th of May, it does seem like uh, everyone has gone into space, um, starting with Virgin Galactic, uh, which were the, who were the first of the uh, commercial tourist flights to go up and um, they went up on the 11th of July. Richard Branson said he wasn't going early just to beat Jeff Bezos, but he was, of course he was. It's been a very painful development for, for Virgin. Uh, it started nearly two decades ago and it finally happened and they just reached, reached space at 83 kilometers high, just over 50 miles the official start of space. They managed just four minutes weightless in space. Well, while the technical aspects of these flights, I'm sure most of you know about them, are very interesting, it's actually the people that I find more interesting. There, there were two pilots on this flight. You, you can always tell the pilots because they wear big boots. And there were four mission specialists to test the experience. One of them was Richard Branson, who calls himself Astronaut One. He was certainly the first billionaire in space. I guess that counts for something. The spacecraft has a final capacity of eight, and people, eight people, including two pilots. So commercial flights should start soon, although they did wander off course on the way down which was under investigation by the FCC. But I think I heard today that that's been cleared. So we, we should be seeing uh, commercial flights from Virgin Galactic starting again soon. Right, Blue Origin went up next on the 20th July with uh, Jeff Bezos and three other passengers, second billionaire in, place, in space. Quite a small spacecraft taking up to seven people. But again, not into orbit. It went higher than Virgin at 66 miles. That's uh, just over 100 kilometers high. It was designed with space tourism in mind, 
just giving a few minutes taste of viewing Earth from space and a few minutes of weightlessness. So who went on, on, this, uh, on this trip? Well, Jeff Bezos obviously went, and then a clone of Jeff Bezos. Oh no, actually that's his brother, Mark. And then Oliver Damon went on the, uh, at the top right there, if you can see that, that picture. Uh, he, was, he was 18 years old and the youngest person to visit space ever. His seat was bought by his father, who it's, who it's rumored he paid $28 million for it, but who knows. Uh, the most interesting pa passenger were these pictures down the bottom here, Wally Funk. Um, she was a test pilot back in the 60s and uh, for the Mercury space program, Women in Space, which unfortunately was later canceled. She's now 82 years old, the oldest person to go into space. So both the oldest and the youngest person were together on the same flight. Quite uh, interesting, really. Then much more recently, on the 15th of September, Inspiration4 went up. When I first thought this story, I thought, a billionaire pays to go into orbit. Mm, so what? Uh, you know, at least the previous two billionaires had actually developed the spacecraft. But actually, there's more to this story. Um, it's, it's quite more interesting. It went up for three days in orbit. The ship comprised the SpaceX Dragon and the Falcon 9 rocket. The Dragon module is shown here, and it was modified, it modified to include the new bubble observation dome. It was launched into an orbit actually higher than the space station of 585 kilometers high. And it was the second flight of this particular Dragon module and the third flight of the Falcon 9 booster. Reusable, that's really good. The billionaire who paid for the flight is uh, the guy on the uh, second from the right. Uh, is Jared Isaacman. He made his money uh, with, in finance in a company called Shift4, speeding up bank transfers. But he is also an ace pilot flying ex-military jets and heading up a display team. He dedicated this trip raising, to raising money for St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. He started off by giving them a donation of $100 million. That's a pretty amazing. There they all are, squeezed into the observation dome. Uh, the girl up front with the hair um, is uh, Haley, Haley Arcano, 22 years old, and she had bone cancer as a child and was cured by prolonged treatment at St. Jude's. She now works there as an assistant physician. Uh, Christopher Sembrusi, who's in the middle there, He's an Air Force veteran. His seat was given to St. Jude's and they raffled it off and the winner decided to give it to Christopher who'd always wanted to go into space. The fourth passenger at the top right is Sean Proctor, uh, an American geology pro communicator, professor and a science communicator. She won a number of business awards and was chosen by Jared, the billionaire. So the mission had a number of firsts. It was the first all civilian flight to go into orbit. Haley was the youngest American to go into orbit, to orbit. And Haley was also the first person in space with a prosthesis. She has a rod in her leg from her knee down to her ankle as part of her treatment. So there were tests done on that because that's the first as well. <clears throat> so coverage of the flight wasn't open to the public. Details of the mission are now showing on a far part four part series on Netflix. I've watched half of it and I thought mm, that, that might be interesting. It's actually very interesting. If you've got access to net, net Netflix, it's worth a watch. The mission as a whole was considered to be a milestone for commercial space flight. So the pundits say. And finally, a brief update on Starship and Super Heavy, another SpaceX venture. No passengers involved this time. So all the missions above are all very well, but they're a bit like playing with space, dipping a toe into space, more for tourism and not for science. 
This rocket will be the largest and most powerful to date. It's one that will hopefully take people to Mars and be the primary car carrier for all future space activities. The super heavy section has just been changed for prototype four. This is the one planned to go in orbit. The previous one was used for test firings. And the FCC launch plan is in progress. That's a big step. Um, so it could actually take off in November, but certainly before the end of the year. And it will be either be an amazingly successful launch or the most spectacular firework display we've ever watched. So uh, watch this space. Thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Okay, uh, so next up we've got Jared, who's going to tell us about the King's Langley sundial. So over to Jared. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'll be talking about the King's Langley sundial, which has been recently installed in King's Langley. I first suggested the idea five years ago, and it's taken that long to um, happen. Um, okay. Not moving for you. Okay. Oh, there we are. That is being um, installed. Uh, there's David Brown, who's laying the sundial. It's a flat sundial. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, if you can see the line, the string, it's all to do with making sure that it's properly aligned. I don't know if you can see the, um, the string. Uh, you want to use pointers at the top, okay. of the top of me. Oh, okay, the string goes along there. Okay. Okay, so this is the actual sundial itself. Um, so I'm just trying to use. So here you can see the hour marks. Sorry. Okay, and one stands at the center here, and you've got the months, and it's pointing uh, due north. Um, you can see down here, you can't see in the detail, but involved uh, a number of people were involved with the like the council and so on and uh, uh, a local engineering company yeah. so i'm just going to them trying to go to the next one just manually okay so that's my wife on the sundial and Uh, it's about six o'clock. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about a human sundial, it's one of the few instruments where the person is part of the instrument. Trying to go to the next slide. I'm going to have to do it this way. Yeah. Uh, that's the official opening. Um, and the three other people are from the local, um, from Kings Langley Parish Council, who... Um, did a lot to make the uh, project happen. And uh, this is um, some visitors from Southwest Hearts Astronomy Society when it was officially opened. Um, so it's there now. So um, please do come and visit on Kings Langley Common, if you know where that is, on the other side of where the, um, uh, of, of where the cricket pavilion is. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Jared. Yeah. So um, we're just going to move on then to uh, the main presentation with Aris. So just give us a second while we switch over computers and uh, hopefully that'll be seamless enough. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. It's been a few years since I was here last. Uh, thank you to Sean for extending the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Aris Dakanalis. Um, I am a part-time PhD student at UCL as part of the um, UCL Antikythera group, Antikythera Mechanism uh, Research Group. Uh, I also happen to be a teacher here at RMS, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ian, uh, who gave up um, some of his time uh, before the pandemic where we, when we installed our new telescope and he helped us with the installation. So we have a, a just over nine inch reflector uh, from Celestron now and hoping to do some astrophotography with girls. We've got a 
cohort of uh, 19 GCSE astronomy students this year. So we are growing just like you are. Um, so I am here today to talk to you about our research at UCL on the magnificent device known as the Antikythera mechanism um, on the occasion of uh, a publication that caught the um, public eye last spring. Um, this is the journal it was published, Scientific Reports, which is part of the Nature family of journals. And as you can see, it's got over 200,000 uh, views so far, and uh, it's in the top uh, 99th percentile of uh, art, similar articles that have been published. So it's done really, really well. You might have caught it on the news a few months ago. Uh, we were, we got coverage on various news outlets, BBC, uh, Guardian, um, um, American Scientific and others. So um, I'll show you the link for that later. So today I'm going to talk to you a little about the mechanism, just so you know what this is about. Um, why we think there were uh, the planets and the gearing for the planets on it. Uh, blow your mind with ancient Babylonian mathematics and astronomy, because that's where it all started. And um, how we think the ancient designer would have incorporated those planetary periods into the mechanism, which is what our research paper was about. So this is the lump that was um, salvaged from about um, 60 or 90 meters, I can't remember, below the surface of the sea in Greece uh, as part of a shipwreck um, that um, sank in the first century BC, just off the coast of this island, not this island, but the island in red uh, on the left here um, called Antikythera. And it's called the Antikythera mechanism because that's where the shipwreck was found. And the other island on the other side is the island where the uh, sponge divers that salvaged it came from. So it was salvaged uh, just at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the cargo had treasure on it, magnificent artifacts, beautiful artifacts, which were um, antiques for the time. So we believe, for example, that the philosopher dates from the fourth century. So if the shipwreck was from the first century, it was already 300 years old when it was being carried God knows to where, some say back to Rome to be sold in Roman markets, but we really don't know. Um, just, just to show that it had other beautiful cargo, which I've shown you before. And this is what the mechanism looks today because it broke into many pieces because it dried up. It, it was mainly made of bronze um, and it was in a wooden case. And of course it dried up, it cracked open. And it's a good thing that it cracked open because someone noticed that it's got this scale here. And they went, hang on, this has got a scale. It looks like an instrument. And then they started studying it more closely. So this is how it looks like today. It's on display on the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Well worth a visit. Um, this is how it looks on, on the other side. And you can see there's text, there's fragments, and more importantly, there's a very large gear there. But as you can see in this state, you can hardly read the text, you can hardly see the gearing. So certain techniques were used uh, to read the text and to look at the gearing. The first technique is called polynomial texture um, imaging, and it's, it composes of this um, dome, which lights the device from various different angles. And you take hundreds of photos and you feed them into a piece of software which then removes all the noise and you can read the uh, contours uh, very easily. It's used today in um, art very much. And I don't know if you read the paper just last week. Uh, they said AI says that a certain Rubens at the National Gallery was a fake. Um, they, they use similar techniques as this to look at the brush strokes on the canvas and see whether they match the general style of the artist, for example. Um, another technique was uh, computer tomography, and I'll show you a nice little video here uh, made by one of my supervisors. Um, so this is a, us going inside the device like a ghost, and you can see all the engineering structure went into it, gearing, arbors, um, spacers, 
This is proper Hellenistic engineering. We believe it was made at the earliest, somewhere in the second century BC, and at the latest, early first century BC. So it survives in about 87 fragments in um, the way it is today, and we believe it would have had tens of gears. Um, very clever. The, devices the device has been interpreted, and I'll show you the functions in a minute. Um, if taken apart and exploded view, according to our latest reconstruction, looks like this. Our reconstruction starts from this gear and to the front. So what you see from, from this gear and to the back is undisputed. It's definitely acceptable by everyone. We hope that our reconstruction is plausible enough and will convince most of the scientific community. So what did it do? On the back dial, it had a um, mechanized scheme to reconcile the civil calendar with the seasons. The reason is that the civil calendars in antiquity were lunar. They used the synodic month. And you can't make up a whole number of synodic months for the tropical year. And therefore you need an algorithm to basically intercalate, to just add or remove days to make it work. We do that today with bisectile years. Every four years, we add a day to February to make sure that our calendar doesn't go off of the seasons. They did a similar thing, a little bit more sophisticated because lunar calendars are a bit iffy. Um, it had other functions. I spoke about these the other day, so I won't bother with you um, today about these functions. Um, the other major function on the bottom was this other dial. How this works is there's a pointer follower. So this is a pointer. It's kind of like an, an old, um, what are they called in English? LP, LP player. So you can imagine there's this um, pointer and there are these grooves. So as the gears turn, they turn this pointer and the pointer follows the grooves. So it indicates to various months. And what these sections show is essentially an ancient Babylonian scheme for eclipse prediction. So it basically would tell you on a given month whether you would have a lunar, a solar eclipse, what time of the day it would happen, and also additional information such as the direction of obscuration. Now you might think, wow, that's very impressive. How on earth could they do that down to the hour? Well, you haven't seen nothing yet. I promise to blow your mind with some Babylonian astronomy in a few slides from now. So as you can see, this was a very sophisticated instrument, um, engineering-wise, astronomy-wise, and it was made over 2,000 years ago. So I hope that after today's talk, I will change your mind about our modern perspective, which tends to think down on, our, on the accomplishments of our predecessors, but you will see that in ancient Babylon, there were some very clever people doing amazing maths and making mathematical models over 3,000 years ago. Um, so today I want to talk to you about a specific part of the mechanism. So this is all the gearing, the way it has been reconstructed. Um, the gears in red on the, on the left of your screen, those are not present, but we know from the function of the calendar what they should have looked like. So pretty sure, we are pretty sure that even though these are missing, we, we are pretty sure that those are exactly the gears that you would have needed to perform the functions that it does perform. And then all this gearing is present. Um, so as you can see, it's quite complicated. All this is one gear train with um, four outputs, four main outputs. So it's really amazing, very cleverly designed. Um, but today I want to talk to you about this missing bit. So this is a bit which does not survive. And it says here, this is from the original publication in Nature uh, 15 years ago, which basically um, solved all of the functions once and for all. Well, actually it was a, a second publication two years later, which added a few more things. But those two Nature publications in 2006 and 2008 basically um, completely deciphered the back dials. So today I want to talk to you about what would the front would have looked like? And that was the thrust of our publication. So how do we know that there would have been something in the front? Well, looking at the x-rays, at the CT scans, 
there are these pillars on the main drive wheel. So this is the drive wheel, which is, um, which basically powers uh, all of the mechanism. And as you can see, it has these mounts. And these mounts are quite symmetrical and they have a particular shape and a particular height. So it's certain that some structure was mounted on these pillars, which is now missing because the mechanism was broken uh, during the shipwreck. I mean, it was, you, you saw the cargo during a storm, it would have capsized, it would have fallen over, probably smashed by a statue into bits and then sank into the bottom of the sea. So there must have been structure there, which is missing. And um, there are other elements which also show that there are features for support structures. And also there's a single gear which doesn't fit anywhere in the rear. This is fragment D and as you can see, it's got many layers. So there's one layer here, which is a plate. And you can see across, across as a um, square section there for the, for the arbor. Then there is a gear and then there is this kidney shaped plate. And these are all one on top of the other. So these are different layers on the X-ray. And putting it all together, we believe it would have looked something like this when it was made. So you can see here, there's the main drive wheel. And here are those pillars I was telling you about. And you can see that the shape of the pillars invites us to interpret what sort of structure would have been on it. So those four pillars are the same shape and they're opposite each other. So what could they have possibly supported? Probably a plaque like this. The other four pillars are the same size and they are uh, positioned at 12, 9, 6 and, nine, and um, 3 o'clock. So we probably, they probably would have supported a circular plate like this. And this is the other gear I was telling you about, fragment D, which has these three layers, one on top of the other. So looking at the data, our team made some um, good guesses about what we think was being supported there. So this must have housed gearing, without a doubt. What would that gearing um, represent? Well, to that, we need to turn to the inscriptions. And if you read the inscriptions, the translation being on the right, you can see that there are certain keywords, Aphrodite, Venus, Phosphorus, it's, it's a theophoric name, Stillborn, Mercury, Sun, Aries, me, <laughs> Mars, uh, Zeus, Jupiter, Phaethon, Kronos, Saturn, and they are, little spheres are mentioned in connection with each planet. You can see it's very fragmentary, sadly. There are a lot of lacunae, um, but you know that's the best we can do. So there are spheres associated with planets and they are making their way through certain um, peripheries. Where's the word periphery? Um, there, periphery. So they are going through circles. So planets going around through circles in the right order this means that there would have been a planetarium display with the earth in the center and the planets going around the earth per the cosmological model of the time and pointers are mentioned and they are carried on pointers some of some of these objects like the sun and if you look at the front there's this scale so there were things revolving like so and they were pointers now we're pointing at this scale powered by the gearing. What are these two scales? Well, this is a calendar. It's the Egyptian calendar with 365 days. And you could actually remove it, turn it one day and put it back in to count for bisextile years. Um, so it's a removable annulus. You remove it, turn it, there are 365 holes and you literally turn it a little bit and put it back in. It's very clever. And the inner um, row is the zodiac. So put two and two together, this was the celestial sphere. It would show the location of the planets on the celestial sphere on any given date. Very, very interesting. And what is it representing? Just the cosmology of the time. What the astronomers and scientists and philosophers of the time believed that the universe looked like. Um, the Earth in the center with all the five known planets plus the sun and the moon orbiting um, in circles upon circles. 
And I love this. this, this was, I took this image on the left when I went to the British Library. There was an exhibition uh, a couple of years ago for um, old English books from the 10th century. And you could hear recordings of old English. Sounds nothing like English, uh, <laughs> but it was amazing. And one of these textbooks from the time um, is the model of the heavens. And you can look at the images, the image here. If I can zoom, can I zoom in? Never mind. But if you, yeah, I can zoom in. Um, Lucifer, light bringer. Lucifer looks fur, ferro means to bring. Lucifer, light bringer, it's Venus. And it's the same as Phosphorus, which we see on the Antikythera mechanism. Then there's Phaeton here, which is exactly the name we see on the Antikythera mechanism. So you can see how uh, ninth century um, monks drew upon the knowledge stored passed on to them via ancient Greece and the tradition. But modern history likes to say that science started with the Greeks. Now I'm Greek, I'd be crazy to go against them, right? But I have to acknowledge that in ancient Babylon, some really, really interesting science was happening way before what we call classical civilization ever existed. I mean, let's face it, the Greeks were latecomers to the party, right? They were the Mesopotamians, they were Sumerians, they were ancient Egyptians, thousands of years before the Greek civilization. And, I mean, there was proto-Greek civilization. Don't get me wrong, fellow Greeks, if you're watching this. But there was the Minoans, there was the um, Mycenaeans, but they did not have that level of astronomy that we see in Babylon. They were doing some things, surely, with astronomy, but what we see in Babylon, my goodness. So Babylonians, they are called Babylonians, they're not just Babylonians, they were Assyrians, Akkadians, uh, Sumerians, peoples, Semitic peoples that lived in modern day Iran and Iraq. And um, they started observing the night sky ever since the dawn of the second millennium, even earlier. The, the late third millennium, so we're talking 2000 years BC. And they had good observations, but they weren't very qualitative. They weren't quantitative, sorry, they were a bit qualitative. And then came this king, Nabonassar, in the eighth century. And he ordered all the previous records to be destroyed. And he set up effectively a branch of the civil service with professional astronomers, professional observers of the night sky that would go out every night and record literally everything that they saw in terms of the motion of the moon, the sun, the planets, um, meteorological phenomena. He wanted to remain as this great instigator of an astronomical tradition. So he erased all the previous records and started proper new records, which were much, much more detailed and much better. And a lot of these records survived hidden in a cache in the library of the palace in Nineveh, which is in modern day Mosul. Sadly, religious fundamentalists have mostly destroyed the palace today, so not much of it remains. A Danish group, I think it was Danish, um, managed to reproduce some of the wonderful buzz reliefs from the palace using photographs that they uh, got from, they asked, people that had visited Nineveh to send them their pictures and then they stereographically um, merged the images together and reproduced the buzz release. So even though the palace is destroyed now, you can still see the wonderful buzz release that, like the one we see. So let me show you what the products of their hard labor, which, which lasted well into Hellenistic times. It lasted well into Roman times, I would say. So for the better part of 800 years, this tradition was kept alive, initially by um, Babylonians, but then the Persians who conquered them inherited the tradition. And they were doing it for astrology, don't get me wrong. It was just for astrological predictions. They were nuts about astrology. They, they thought that looking at the motion of the planets, could they could foresee the future. They were omens to be interpreted. But as they were gathering all this data, eventually they realized that there are patterns and they were so good at deciphering the patterns that they were able to predict eclipses with excellent accuracy to the hour, uh, even the direction of obscuration, like I said. 
Um, and here's one such tablet. I want to show you something that hopefully will impress you enough. So this is a tablet from the um, second century BC. This is a slightly later tablet. And what you see here, all these wedge-shaped symbols, they're called cuneiform writing, which is the traditional writing of the time. It's just using a reed stylus with a sharp end. You just press indentations on a clay tablet and you create these markings. And these markings are all numbers. And they are numbers in what we call sexagesimal notation, base 60. So they're not base 100 like ours, they are base 60. And you can guess why, because they're astronomical. They basically, you use base 60 because you put it on a circle and you can do degrees straight away. So what is this first column on the left? It's, oh, actually, well, I'll tell you about the graph in a minute, but let's look at the first column on the left. It's just that number 2.59 is just the year, according to some king. And then there are 12 numbers, months. So all these are months. And then you see on the furthest column, there are these symbols, and they are, of course, the symbols of the zodiac. And from the title, we understand that this is, these are dates for conjunctions between the sun and the moon. And if these are conjunctions, what could those other numbers be on the right? Well, they're obviously ecliptic longitudes. So they just mark where the conjunction happened on the ecliptic. Now, the Jesuit monks that studied these in the 19th century, of all people, it was for Jesuit monks that were the fathers of Assyriology, um, they realized that there are patterns. They played around with the maths and they realized that, for example, you start with this longitude. If you add this number, you get that number. If you start with the one below and add this number, you get that number. So this is basically an algorithm. And hang on a second. If these are ecliptic longitudes for conjunctions, what are these numbers? No, they're the lunar velocity. They are the angular velocity of the sun because this is how much, how many degrees the sun has covered in a month. So Kepler, discovering the fact that the sun has a variable speed. This is 800 BC. Well, it started at 800 BC. This tablet is from 200 BC. And you see here a model that basically measures. I mean, look, these are basically uh, delta phi. They are basically the angular, the angular longitude that the sun covers in a month. So this is delta T. So delta phi over delta T, this is omega. It's just the angular speed of the sun. And as you can see, it's variable. So they are modeling the heavens using mathematical zigzag functions. <laughs> I hope this blows your mind a little bit because, you know, we think we are very clever and we discovered everything with the Renaissance. But these people, look at that. And this is a, this is a lovely, lovely mathematical way. And it's got parameters. And all of these parameters were derived from observations, centuries worth of observations. They were models like these to predict things like the variation in the latitude of the moon around, the, um, around its orbit, around the ecliptic and, and all that. That's why they could tell all these things with immense accuracy. Very impressive stuff, I, I should say, and yet, we still want to say that science started with the Greeks. I'm very sorry, even though they all did it for astrology, I don't know what this is if it's not mathematical modeling of reality, which is what science does. So I'd say this is science. It's just science with motivated by astrology. I mean, this is the birth of astronomy. Have no doubt this is how astronomy started in that, in that part of the world for all of us. We're grateful to these Jesuit monks that basically translated all these and let us in the secret. So planets. Planets, obviously, in today's terms, we know that they orbit the Earth in elliptical orbits. And sometimes, from our point of view, they meet. They meet together, they meet with the sun, and we call these synodic phenomena. Synodos in Greek means on the same street. So meeting, we met someone on the same street. But it also means alignment. And that's excellent because the Greeks were all about geometrical models. 
So from the US perspective, I'm going to go into Stellarium as well, like Richard earlier. And I'm going to show you something that feels like I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, a lot of people on Zoom don't know um, what I'm about to show them. So I'm going to follow Mercury. So if I'm going to type, oh, why can't I type? Um, are we already following Mercury? Yeah, I'm already following Mercury. Okay, so if you can focus on Mercury, you will see that, can you all see Mercury? Okay, we are focusing on Mercury and we're looking at what it's doing with relation to the sun. And you can see that it's moving around the sun. Its angle is changing because the angle of the ecliptic is changing throughout the year. It's steeper in the spring than it is um, in um, uh, autumn. Um, and Mercury is moving back and forth. So sometimes it moves in the same direction as the sun. You can see now that it reaches its furthest distance from the sun. And then it sort of stops with respect to the stationary stars, moves backwards, moves at its maximum distance um, on the other side, stops again and starts again. So these are all the familiar stations, um, last morning rising, last evening um, setting that a lot of you will be familiar with. Um, so these are the synodic phenomena of the planets. And a planet would therefore, as it comes close to the sun, it will disappear because it's too close to the sun to be seen. And also you'll get to see it uh, if it's an inner planet like Mercury and Venus. Venus especially, you know, we call the evening star and the morning star, depending on which side of, of the sun it's on, right? Um, and therefore they, the Babylonians would record all of these phenomena meticulously. And in the end, they, they recorded not only the dates that they happened, but also where on the celestial sphere they would happen. And so these are four superior planets and you all know perhaps that superior planets also do this retrograde motion when the earth overtakes them. Inferior planets do this similar as well. I won't bother you too much with this. They, they also have similar synodic phenomena like the slightly different for superior planets than there are for inferior planets, but it doesn't matter. So here's a summary of all the synodic phenomena. And here is a tablet, a Babylonian tablet, presently in the British Museum. You can have a look at it in room 55 when you're there next. And it's the Venus tablet of um, Amisaduka, dating from the eighth century BC. And let's see what it says about Venus. It says, east of the sun, it stays visible for eight months, five days, then it vanishes for three months. Then it can be seen again on the west, on the western side of the sun for eight months and five days. And then it only stays invisible for seven days, um, a total of 587 days for its synodic cycle. The modern value is 584. I'd say this is not too shabby for 8th century BC. So really, really um, old text. And this is a very old cycle, uh, even older than the 8th century, but it started to become more accurate during the 8th century. So they were recording all these durations. Now, it's not just when they happen, is, is there a pattern? And it turns out that there is a pattern. So if you go from one conjunction to the next, to the next, to the next, do they happen in a whole number of years? Does a whole number of conjunctions happen in a whole number of years? They were looking for patterns like these, and we call those synodic cycles. So for example, there's a, so there's a synodic period for Venus, which says that there are five synodic phenomena in eight years. What does that mean? It means that if you have a conjunction, in a certain part of the sky. It will happen again in the same part of the sky eight years later, and there will have been four more conjunctions in between. So there are all these patterns. And you can see here on this graph that they don't happen one after the other. For example, here we have one in 2017, and let's follow the path. Go all the way around here, and then the next conjunction will happen in Oops, I went a bit too far, in 2020. And then all the way back there, and then the next conjunction would happen, um, no, actually 2018, I missed the 218. So anyway, you start from 2017, then the next one would happen here, then the next one would happen there, then there, then there. So the ecliptic longitudes vary. And the ancient Babylonians were so good that they modeled 
the changes in the ecliptic longitudes using the zigzag functions that I showed you earlier. So they started to be able to predict where these retrogradations would happen um, and when. And they had these lovely periods. And with observations, they even managed to note the errors. So here are some tablets uh, I've collected, and they all show the same period, five, five conjunctions in eight years, but you can see they attest different errors. So they say, yes, it's, it's almost eight years, but it's actually four days earlier. Another one says it's two and a half days earlier. Another one says, no, it's on the day, but it's actually four degrees uh, to the left than what you said, not exactly where you said it would happen. Another one says, no, it's four days again. So now I want to point your attention to this error here. By the way, they were very competitive with each other, the ancient Babylonians, because they were vying for the favor of the king. And there's an amazing tablet where it's a letter to the king because they kept these diaries and they sent them to the king with their predictions. And they were trying to prove that they were the better astro astronomers slash astrologers. And there's one of my favorites that says, such and such a person, my king, he said that Venus would rise on the 25th. He's a cheat, a charlatan. Do not believe him. <laughs> so, you know, much like what happens today with between astrologers. No, I'm just joking. Don't believe, I don't suppose any, many of you believe in astrology, but you can see how it's, it's been happening for a very long time. But they were vying for power. They were vying for favor. And of course, for money. So look at this period now says here that Venus will perform 720 conjunctions in 11,151 years. Now, surely no one stayed out, out for 11,051 years and recorded observations. So this number cannot have been produced by observational data, whereas all these are obviously from observational data. Uh, this one has zero error. It says there's no error. So how on earth do you get this lovely period? Well, mathematics. So let's see, look at the last one. It says two and a half degrees. Two and a half degrees error is compounded to a full circle after 144 repetitions, right? So because two and a half times 144, you get the full 360 degrees. So 144 times eight, this would happen in 1100, and 52 years. But remember, there's one whole error, one whole uh, year in error, and you get 151. So also time the number of synodic events times 144, you get this synodic period. So some, some periods that the Babylonians came up with were not observational. They were mathematical. No one would have stayed up for a thousand years to generate this, this, this period. And Let's look at these periods from Mercury. And I wanna draw your attention to these numbers here. Here it says minus three days. This one says minus one day. And this one says no error, spot on, same day. So Mercury will perform 394 synodic events over 125 years, same day. How did you get that? Well, they basically did linear combinations of errors. They said, ah, if I've got this period and it's three days off, and I've got the other period and it's one day off. If I multiply the one which has the error of one day three times, and I take away the period which has one day error, the total error is nil. And that's exactly what they did. They went, take that period, times it by three, minus three error, minus minus three, you add three, and then you end up with no error. So you get this period shown there. So they were manipulating the periods that they found mathematically based on errors to come up with better, more accurate periods that they could then feed into their mathematical models to make astrological predictions. Amazing, amazing stuff. I, I, I cannot get enough of this. Every time I see them do this science, I'm just blown away by how clever they were. How does this relate to our device? This is fragment G. And if you look at it, that translation, it clearly refers to passages. There's a bit on Mercury, there's a large bit on Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And you can see there are some letters which correspond to numbers on the Venus bit and on the Saturn bit. And if you look at the text, 
It's exactly what I've been telling you about. It describes the synodic phenomenon and it says, look at that. Phosphorus, that's Venus. Zodiacal sign equal in that many number of years, there are that many restitutions and each restitution, 484 days. That's the modern value, by the way. Um, elong it regresses to its greatest elongation in that number of days. It approaches the sun, it arrives at the evening station being distant from the sun. So it basically describes all these synodic phenomena for each planet. Now this is on our device, remember, which has that planetarium. So, okay, let's sum up all the data. We have these pillars. We know that they were supporting some structures. We have one gear from them. We have all this textual evidence which describes the regressions and retrogradations of planets, and we have other descriptions of planets there. Well, if it walks like a duck, <laughs> it must be a planetarium. So the next question is, okay, what would the gearing would have looked like if it's a planetarium? And how can we try and model what the gearing, the lost gearing would have looked like? Well, first of all, I wanna tell you something about these numbers, about Venus and Saturn. Neither of these are attested on any Babylonian records. They're unique to the Greeks. And hang on, that's weird because the Greeks never had any such observational tradition like the Babylonians did. So they can't be of Greek origin. So there might be two things happening here. Either they existed in Babylonian records, but they are lost, or they were novel and they were produced in a different way. Up till this paper of ours, no one had been able to fully explain how someone might have arrived to these two numbers. And we believe we found how. So there is a mathematical proposition. I'm not gonna bother you with the details. It's, it's found in a, Plato's, one of the, the dialogues of Plato. And it's just an algorithm to basically take um, ratios to approximate a given value. So I'm not gonna bother you with that. But what you can do is like what I've shown you, you can actually start generating linear combinations of periods. And if you know the seed values, you can generate planetary periods for all the planets using this method. And using this method, you can actually make the ones that I just showed you. So we believe we stumbled upon the method which the ancient designer used to generate those two unique planetary periods. So if we knew the method, we could then extrapolate it to the other planets. And how would they, how would they then choose which planetary periods to use? Well, now you have to stop putting your astronomers and mathematicians hat you have to put it away and put your engineer's hat on because all these will have to be translated into gearing. So each of these periods, for example, this number of years can be expressed as a number of factors. And these factors are basically your tooth counts will have to correspond to tooth counts for gears. So we believe they did something very clever because we've got evidence for that from other bits. And the answer is, they generated this large pool of potential periods and went with the ones that shared common factors. And you'll see why that's important in the video I'm gonna show you later. The, the reason they share common factors is that they can actually share these gears between different gear trains and thus use fewer number of gears. So we came up with certain designs um, we actually being David and Tony, they are the ones that came up with the, with the gearing. I just did the legwork for the planetary periods uh, on the Babylonian side. And using this structure, the evidence for the structure, uh, Tony and David started to come up with um, designs for gearing. And these are the best ones. This is the best one that they found for the inferior planets. And this is the best one that they came up with for the superior planets. Looks complicated, but all this, all everything that you see is actually attested for in the rear. So we've got evidence for the mechanisms that they used, that we are using here on the rear of the mechanism. So we're just not making this up. Um, they, they knew how to do this. And you can see all the common factors here, seven, seven, um, and then early on the previous slides, 17, 17, for example. And you can put those gears in the middle and have the others rotate around them. So starting from the evidence, we started to build up the models and ended up with this. I know it looks a bit over the top. 
I mean, okay, maybe the, the front bit could be slightly different, but the gearing is quite, is quite clever, I think. Um, Tony and David have done a, a brilliant job. So this is a link to our article. I just want to show you two, three videos. They're all like one minute each. Um, so you can visit the article and have a read for yourself. Just want to show you some animations uh, right here at the end. Okay, there we go. So let's enjoy. Now you see why the common factors matter. These gears in the middle are the common factors and they're going to be shared by other gear trades. So you have this carousel, which has mounts for gears, and those gears would revolve around the central gears, and those central gears are the common factors. So you basically can make a very clever design uh, by sharing common factors, by choosing your planetary periods using the right maths. So there's just enough space for everything to fit. Now, all this is missing, by the way, and it's hypothetical. So it's our reconstruction, but as you can see, it's based on solid evidence. It's the best reconstruction so far, or so we say. So these pins and slots that you see, they introduce the, vari the variable motion for the planets and they are responsible for the retrogradation. So you would have seen the planets perform retrogradations where they were meant to happen because they are described on the text. <laughs> so the text is basically the user manual. You would have held the text in front of you while someone would have turned the knob, powered the device, and you would have seen all those lovely retrogradations and then you fit everything together. all the mounts for the rings we believe they were rings perhaps they weren't rings perhaps they were pointers it doesn't matter we we like to think they were rings so we have this elaborate elaborate device and there are the little spheres on the text we like to think they were different colored jewels because they are described as having different colors and there you have it that will be the end result probably second century bc And I'd like to show you a second video, which shows you the whole thing. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, look at it. It would have been a sight to behold. So before I finish, I want to show you all of it together in one go. So the right-hand side is definitely undisputed. The left-hand side is our latest work. And it's the only one that matches all the evidence that exists on the mechanism. So we like to think it's the best. Absolutely smashing. <laughs> so I hate to break it to you. Our beloved astronomy started as astrology somewhere in Babylon. <laughs> they were mad about predictions and um, that's why they started observing the night sky so much. So if anyone wants to read up on all of this, I suggest a couple of books. The one on the left is the cheapest, £11 uh, from uh, Otto Neugebauer, who did a lot of work on the cuneiform uh, interpretations of these tablets called the Exact Sciences of Antiquity. It's really short. And if you want to read more about why um, we don't really talk too much about the Babylonians. You've got to read Francesca's, uh, Francesca Rothberg's uh, book, Before Nature, Geneform Knowledge and the History of Science. She talks all about these. And finally, if you go on YouTube and you Google Antikythera Cosmos, there's the video made by my supervisor and our research group. It's uh, freely available on YouTube, 30 minutes. You'll see much more of what I 
told you, presented by my supervisor. So thank you for your attention. Take some questions. I'd love to take some questions. So uh, one of the members of our research group is a professional horologist. So if he says it's feasible, I believe him. Um, he does that for a living. I've seen there are people commenting on our work, which are amateur horologists, and they say, oh, this is too hard. It is too hard. But why look down on those people when they've clearly built something brilliant? I mean, if you, I've, I've, I've looked at the contemporary sources in the literature, and there is a description from the fourth century that describes the engineers of the second century and how they were trained. And when you read it, it's like modern engineers. He describes, he says, Hero says, Papus describes the engineers of Hero in the first century in Alexandria. And he says, the engineer is trained from a young age in mathematics, geometry, astronomy, bronze making as a foreman in directing groups of men, of workmen, um, building, construction, and if he learns all of these from a young age, he will become a great inventor of mechanical works. It's right there. It's just that most of it is gone and there's very little evidence from ancient technology, but ancient technology was definitely present. And the Antikythera mechanism, we are so fortunate that we found it because otherwise we would have never, we would have never believed that things like this would have been invented in the second century BC. So um, we've built bits of it, and David um, intends to build more of it. If my supervisor has his way, his, he will make him build the whole thing. Uh, but that depends on funding and time and whether David actually uh, is interested to go through all that process. Um, we haven't made our model, but there's another um, horologist from Australia who's made the back dials and you can follow him on, on YouTube. He's called Clickspring, that's his, um, that's his handle, um, Mr. Budisilich. And he's, he's done great work, really amazing work. So he explains how he made everything and how he believes the back dials would have, made, would have been made. So it's uh, up to us to prove that we could make the front dials in the way that we said they would have looked. Thank you. Any other questions? This is UCL, um, uh, UCL, yes, our research group is at UCL. It's a group of, um, there's a metallurgist, there is Tony Freeth, who has done all this major work I showed you earlier on the mechanism. There's um, David, who's a professional horologist. There's Myrto, who's an archaeometallurgist, Myrto Gyogapopoulou. There's Lindsay McDonald, who's an imaging, imaging specialist. And there's myself, where I'm a physicist and uh, astrophysicist. So we got a good mix of disciplines between us because this really needs an interdisciplinary approach. Um, free th he's not technically the project lead because he's not an academic. It has to be an academic. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Adam Wojcik, who is a, a lecturer at UCL. So let's say um, Mr. Professor, Professor Freeth, because now he's an honorary professor at UCL, uh, is our resident expert. And we are very fortunate to have him. And he's, um, no, he's, he's not an engineer. It's uh, Dr. Wojcik is the engineer. Uh, we, are, we are based at UCL Mechanical Engineering. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions. Any questions I'll... on the Zoom, maybe? Is, this, is there anyone yeah, on the see, chat? Yeah, Do you want we... to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's yeah, questions, yeah, on, the the questions on the chat. Yeah. The chats. Right. Could it be? Could it be? Will we be able to purchase a model? Okay. So, well, thank you very much. Um, will we be able to ever purchase a model? Um, maybe in a few years, if my supervisor and I go on a joint venture, we, we say we want to do and, and make one. Um, watch this space. I'm sure someone will do it before us. 
But um, if no one does it before us, maybe we will do it. So watch this space. Uh, Nigel asks, could it be that this was used as a navigational device on the boat it was found on? Uh, that was actually one of the first suggestions. Um, and it was made by an admiral of the Royal Greek Navy um, uh, because, you know, that was his want. Um, no, the answer is no. It would not have been used as a navigational instrument because this is purely an astronomical calculating device. Um, if you're thinking about longitude and eclipses and using eclipses to tell longitude, which they were well aware of that they could do in, in, uh, in uh, ancient times. So the, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek astronomers knew that if you observe an eclipse, um, say in Babylon, and you recorded the time of day, and you observe the same eclipse from a different longitude, and you compare the times that it happened, you could tr translate the difference in times in degrees longitude. Uh, so, yes, they knew the Earth was round in <laughs> antiquity. They did very good geography with it, and they, they used trigonometry to do it. So all that rubbish that, oh, everyone thought that the Earth was flat is just that rubbish. <laughs> so, no, I'm afraid, no, not a navigational tool. I actually think it was something much more interesting. I thought it was either a state gift to a ruler in Greece by a Hellenistic king, or I think it was a dedication to the oracle in Dodona, because then she could make predictions. <laughs> right, okay, thank you very much. All right, thanks again, Aris. That's been a very important talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aris, that was absolutely fantastic. Okay, there you go, Sean. Okay, thanks. Thanks again for that. So um, I think we've reached the end of our meeting tonight. And thank you all for your patience with uh, us teething through these technical problems. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully next time we'll have ironed out some of the wrinkles. And um, until we meet again at the next meeting, it's really nice to have you all here face to face. Just remember that recovery takes much longer than you think, so small baby steps are good. And if you have any suggestions as to how we should do it better next time, please you know, let us know either in person tonight or drop us an email. We're always willing to, to change things and improve things, so suggestions are always welcome. So thanks again for attending and enjoy the refreshments. Thank you.